I'm here to introduce this session, which is on broadband connectivity. And you'll see it's sort of a, a diverse group uh, with different perspectives on that connectivity. And a couple of these have worked closely together. Uh, that is a good thing. And you'll kind of see a theme there. Uh, my job as moderator is to sort of just keep us on time. And to do that, I won't spend as much time introducing folks as I really would like to and probably should. But that's why I encourage you to check out LinkedIn. I've also encouraged uh, our speakers to, as appropriate, give a little bit of their background so that you do know where they're coming from and what experience that they're, they're uh, really talking from as uh, uh, credentials of sorts. So uh, here we go. We do have a relatively packed deal. We've got some in person, a couple virtual a little later in the session. Uh, but we thank you all for being here. So up first, and I would just encourage you to come right on up. You can click this on. And my suggestion is just drive the slides via arrow. That's the slickest way. And so first up, Joseph Sawaski. I used to be in an old guy rock and roll band pre-COVID, but that, that died. So I know how to work a microphone. Not this kind, though, you know, <laughs> as you can tell, right? That works. How's that? Can you hear me okay? Is that all right? Okay. Yes, Dennis, you connected me on LinkedIn right away, and I thought it was fantastic to see what you were up to. And then earlier today, Jigyasa showed me how to scan QR codes in LinkedIn to connect. I never knew that before. So thank you for that. So yeah, it's a great place to connect. Again, my name is Joe Sawaski. I'm the president and CEO of Merit Network in Michigan. I'm a recovering uh, university R1 CIO. Uh, how I ended up in the telecommunications realm, uh, I don't know, but that's, uh, we'll probably, I can talk about that over a beer tonight at dinner, I guess. Um, I was delighted to hear Robert from the USDA this morning uh, talk about the three uh, future pillars, uh, which involve ag tech, broadband, and uh, workforce development. And the presentation that myself and then my colleague, Dr. Johannes Bauer from Michigan State University is gonna transition right into, involves two of those pillars, broadband and workforce development and education. And uh, I, I, I hope you'll stick with us. It's been a long day after a, a two hour uh, present set of presentations and right before dinner. So with that, we'll just go ahead and get started here. So if you don't know Merit, um, Merit is a research and education network. We have a triad mission, the predominant portion of which is networking. We actually are a networking and telecommunications organizations. We also do security and community building across the state of Michigan, as you might have you know, been able to tell from my cybersecurity question this morning involving ag. That's always on my mind, especially today. Um, we're the longest running research and education network in the United States. We were formed by the University of Michigan, Michigan State University, and Wayne State University in Detroit. Uh, we since have uh, grown to be governed by all the public universities in Michigan. We connect uh, over 400 anchor institutions, uh, serve all of K through 12. We've got a true K through 20 network uh, in the state of Michigan. We win that K through 12 business through competitive E-rate uh, work. So, you know, we're a, we're a little nonprofit, but we run like a business. Um, we're an independent 501c3 who's been around since uh, 1966, and you can kind of see the, uh, the anchor institutions and organizations we serve. Uh, just a couple things about Merit's history to kind of create some context here. We were created as a shared service organization when some brilliant faculty member at the University of Michigan and Michigan State and Wayne State said, we ought to be able to share our files between our standalone computers to help you know, uh, uh, contribute to the global uh, information set. So they formed Merit with a, an NSF grant and an award from the state of Michigan. Um, you fast forward into the mid 80s to mid 90s, a little known fact, Merit won the competitive, competitive bid to run the National Science Foundation Network for the United States. You know that little thing now is the global internet. So Merit actually used to operate the, uh, the precursor uh, to the modern internet, which is kind of a cool story. And then uh, really relevant to this conversation, Merit won two BTOP awards in 2010 and 2011, about $139 million to build out more of our own own physical infrastructure, which is an important part of what uh, Merit does where we're a little unique in the research and education network space in that we actually own, operate, manage, roll trucks, fuse fiber. Uh, many r &E networks only lease or IRU their fibers, but we run our own physical plant for over half of our uh, statewide network. 
And talking about that network, we're pretty proud of this. No, no merit presentation is complete. This little old nonprofit owns a lot of infrastructure uh, around the state of Michigan and actually transits the state of Indiana through Illinois, around the Horn through uh, Wisconsin because we've got all these lakes and we need to have redundancy. We can suffer a cut anywhere on this backbone and uh, continue to de deliver backbone and uh, middle mile services. And you know, Merit's mission is really connecting at anchor institutions, primarily education. And we've nearly saturated that market. We really, you know, the, the, the end is near for trying to deliver a high capacity speed to uh, anchor institutions. We're, the job's nearly done in Michigan. And I was actually appointed in uh, 2018 to serve on former Governor Rick Snyder's uh, broadband task force. I represented the uh, universities uh, in their network interests in that conversation. And my eyes were really opened up when I heard the plight of citizens as we did road shows around Michigan, especially in rural areas. I found out that through this, uh, through this, this uh, governor uh, gubernatorial task force, I'll just uh, show you the bad news here. We found in that task force and in, in doing some uh, work with uh, Connected Nation and Connect Michigan, that Michigan ranked 30th in the country for broadband adoption in homes. There are still 368,000 homes in rural Michigan that don't have access to broadband. And the part that really got my attention was 20, over 27% of K through 12 students didn't have high performance connectivity in their home, 25 down and three up, which is what the FCC you know, classifies as broadband. And this was all pre-pandemic. So we had no idea what was about ready to happen to the, the country and the world and to the poor students in Michigan who didn't have uh, adequate broadband connectivity. So I went back to my team at Merritt and I said, you know, the state of Michigan does not have a state broadband office. They were thinking about one. That's what this whole effort uh, that the governor had started was for. But we had nobody centrally thinking about broadband. So I said, why don't we, to complement whatever the state does in the future, launch a program to help expand broadband to residences in Michigan? And I will say that our mission is a research and education network will never be to serve residences. It'll never happen. But I asked my team, what can we do to help private partners and communities actually do that work? So we started this program called the Michigan Moonshot, which was on the title slide. And we've got three pillars of the program you can see here, data and mapping. Um, we actually, Johannes and I co-authored a response to the NTIA when they put out a call for how can we find a better broadband mapping techniques in the, in the country. And uh, we were, you know, uh, promoting this notion of crowdsourcing. And through that NTIA effort, we were delighted because I read every one of the submissions to the NTIA was so, I was so hot about trying to help solve this problem in Michigan. I found this organization called MLab, the measurement lab that I was never aware of prior to that. Um, so we, we started working with them a little bit on the data mapping and we have some great colleagues up at Michigan State University I'll, you know, Dr. Barr will introduce himself, of course, but I have found just such a capable research team that really cares and really gets things done at uh, Michigan State University. I can't, can't speak highly enough about their work. And, and the presentation he'll give that will, you know, follow on mine is, is really a great story of uh, uncovering some things that we didn't know in Michigan about the home, student homework gap. Um, the second part of our uh, triad, uh, you know, uh, strategy is funding and policy. So we help communities figure out ways to get money, uh, to build networks. We actually have a grant program to help them uh, do their own studies within counties and municipalities so they can figure out ways to reach uh, their citizenry. And then we do education and uh, we, we provide a set of resources. We actually created a 700 page online book for a community. It's a one-stop shop about how you start and how you can finish all the way to implementation operations of your own community network. So we leveraged a lot of national experts in this. So we did sort of the, the uh, compiling, but other people wrote the content. We've got one comprehensive resource that we make freely available uh, to folks. And then finally, we've got a marketplace of solutions and we've brought in private vendors that we vet, people that know how to design networks, uh, do financial sustainability studies, build networks, operate networks, run private networks, open access networks. So we've got a whole one-stop shop now for, in Michigan uh, for helping communities uh, get rolling on you know, building their own networks or figuring out how to do better in their communities. And this was all perfect timing unbeknownst to us because the pandemic hit, everybody started to recognize the importance of broadband more than they had in the past. And now we've got literally tens of billions of dollars at the ready 
Uh, and we feel we started to help communities get ready in Michigan in a way that, you know, we just kind of got lucky. We were preemptive, but not uh, cognizant of what was about to come in the pandemic or in these federal opportunities that you heard so much about in the uh, previous session. Uh, our focus is really at the community level. Uh, the state of Michigan is still kind of formed. They've just announced the, uh, the you know, creation of a broadband office. They're still assigning staff, so they still don't really have one in place, but they're working hard on it. But Merritt has been focusing at the county and municip uh, municipal level and township level. We think that's where the action's at. We think those are the people who really care about their communities. So we're trying to help them, and they're being driven by uh, passion to serve you know, their constituency. So that's, that's really cool. And I won't go through all the, the reasons why public and, uh, you know, local engagement's important, but it is. And so the first part of our program involved mapping. I like to tell people mapping equals money. And it certainly is true now. You've got to have a map to ever have the chance to get federal dollars to uh, build out broadband in your communities. So we worked with the measurement lab, with the Coelho Center at Michigan State University, in designing what we think is a Swiss army knife of surveys. And it's great to work with the university researchers because they understand how to protect privacy in these research studies. They have an institutional review board that I know my, my friends here at Purdue are very well aware of in protecting privacy and human subjects. And so the survey we built can really get down, can connect the submission right to the individual in a way that protects privacy. And we can do that for parcel numbers for counties if they're interested in figuring out what kind of tax assessment opportunities they might have. Um, we did it for a university who was interested during the pandemic in understanding which of their students did not have broadband access. And then they targeted scholarships for hotspots and devices to them using the same survey. And the cool part of it is when we're doing all this, we're collecting this data all into one master database for the state of Michigan. And um, I've already talked about the great collaboration that is going on with Michigan State University's Quello Center and the measurement lab. You can see here the number of data collection projects we've done just since the inception of the project. The first one is the one that Dr. Bauer will talk about after my presentation. It was very groundbreaking. And we've used that same technique now for uh, multiple counties. We've, got to, we've done Wayne State University in Detroit. We've got multiple other universities we're teeing up. And I think we've got four other counties in the hopper. And uh, Michigan has 83 counties, uh, a lot of which are rural. So we're, you know, we're carving out a, a large swath of Michigan through these, uh, through these studies. And this is all in preparation for building out broadband in communities. Um, our goals are to get really granular. You know, I'm not going to talk about the F uh, FCC's 477 uh, map. It's you know, not very granular. I, I can at least say that. Uh, these maps that we're creating get right down to the geolocation level, which is uh, really interesting, kind of different. They're more accurate than most of the mapping techniques you'll see that use other, uh, other approaches. Um, we're gathering uh, resident sentiment on their current broadband, how many students are in the home, because we really care about students and learning. And um, we're getting all this information again into one, one master database. And what we've done is we, we've since converted the MLAB survey to Qualtrics, which I know university uh, researchers use a lot. So it's kind of a roll your own survey, but in the end, we connect it to the measurement lab speed test. So we figured out how to use the APIs there, have the resident do the survey, uh, run the speed, run speed test at the end, and we get all this information back. And, and uh, we talked about latency this morning. So you'd be happy to know we're measuring uh, you know, upload, download, speed, latency, and jitter through a whole bunch of different statistics that some of you are probably familiar with through the MLAB facility. And what I love about MLAB is it's an open data source. The thing that's driving me crazy about the current data companies, they're charging a lot for that information and it's kind of a, it's a windfall for them right now, but still you have to buy the data to get, to get the most granular data that they have. MLAB is totally open. It's open for your use. It's open for research. Uh, it's continually growing. It's one of the largest speed, uh, speed test repositories in the world. The technologists will talk about, oh, the technique they use, you know, we're not, that's not the one we prefer, but we use it at Merit. It's good enough for this, this purpose, and it's actually very scientific. So you can see the data we collect. There's a unique ID that's usually generated by the host organization. They send that to us. We connect it to a survey. The, the entity takes the survey. We send that private data set back to the, uh, the, host, the, the, the contracting entity. They decode it. They link it into 
the private data they have so they can get a lot of, uh, again, very granular information. And you can see the kind of uh, stuff we, we collect in addition to the survey. And again, these slides will be made public, so I'm not gonna dwell on a lot of detail here. We've got a lot of outputs. We write executive vignettes and narratives afterward for these organizations, executive summaries. We've got a whole GIS export facility we can do for organizations as well. And uh, people are really liking it. Um, got some samples from a lot of studies here. You can see we did Washtenaw County. One of the really cool things in this study is we showed that <clears throat> the difference between the FCC 477 data, and again, you know, you, you have to have unserved residents to get federal dollars. You got to prove that. And because of the old FCC data, a lot of communities could not get money because they were DQ'd by the Form 477 data. But thankfully, the uh, federal agencies now are really promoting the notion of more crowdsourced uh, information, more granular information. And you can see all around Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is one of the best connected cities in the in the nation, just 10 miles away, much like here in, in West Lafayette, you can see the feds thought that Washtenaw County had 98% of their residents served with broadband. Our study showed, and you can see we had a really high response rate to this study, that only 37% of people in Washtenaw County had that access. So this has opened up new possibilities for the more rural areas of Washtenaw County to, to prepare to get federal grants that before were actually uh, prohibited uh, by federal rule most federal rule. Um, so it was a pretty cool study. We did the same study for Wayne State. I've already mentioned that. You can see the kind of outputs we, we can provide here. We customize all these. And we've done some other uh, county surveys. Berrien County, which is a neighbor just to the, uh, to the north here of Indiana. You can see we're doing the same kinds of things through some uh, pretty neat, neat survey work. And what I want to do now is invite my colleague, uh, Johannes Bauer, to talk about the study that started this all and the really great information it found about the student homework gap and quantifying the student performance gap that results from that homework gap, which had never been done in the United States before. Okay, well, thanks, thanks, Joe, and thanks for the invitation to be here. It's a great pleasure. I've been trying to figure out, okay, how do we relate K-12 education to that set of eclectic topics that we had discussed all day long, right? And one, I think one way to do it is to, uh, there's two ways probably, and you see that the topics resonate through the next 10 minutes that I'll share with you. One is um, that broadband policy in this country has a lot of irrational components, right? I mean, and uh, Chris started to, to refer to this in a moment. Uh, Joe just mentioned it, right? We, we, we have a map that we knew from 2009 on was wrong. This is not this is not new, right? Uh, I was part of a task force that was invited by Larry Strickling, who was then uh, the administrator of the NTIA uh, of academics, to look at the data that they had collected. And we said, you know what? There's the basic assumption that you put behind that map that if there's one person served in a census block, the whole block is served, just leads to a huge bias, especially in rural areas. And so the FCC, in its defense, I must say, they they ask for appropriations to fix the problem for the past 10 years. And Congress is the one who didn't give them the appropriation. But sort of the machinery keeps working, right? And politics frequently is muddling through. So for 10 years, we made funding and subsidy decisions based on a map that we knew was wrong. Right? And so, so those decisions then, of course, also are um, uh, often channeling the funds to, to the wrong, uh, to the wrong uh, locations and, and not channeling funds to locations that would actually need the money. That was one motivation. And, and we initially start, thought we, we would actually be able to use crowdsourcing to fix that issue. And we quickly realized that with crowdsourcing, we missed the most important group, but it's the unconnected. And, and so the whole, all, all these projects that were going on in 2017 when we uh, filed this uh, report to NTIA, that were based on crowdsourcing, miss, were missing sort of the most important group. And so what we did is we developed a method that would actually add those in. Uh, so we have a complete picture of connected, uh, that we have good measurements of the quality of connectivity that they have, and then uh, also of the unconnected. And we, since we couldn't really address all issues that were relevant, if we said, okay, let's just pick one topic. What, what would be really important to address? And so the, at that time, the homework gap was widely discussed. The notion of homework gap, uh, you may remember, 
was a term that uh, Jessica Rosenworth at that point in time was an, a commissioner at the FCC. Now she is the acting chairwoman of the FCC, actually. She, she wrote an op-ed for the Miami Herald in 2014 in December, kind of like a Christmas story, right? And pointed out that there is many, many students in the United States who, who are se severely disadvantaged because they do not have access to broadband. And from that, it developed into a meme sort of, right? And, and, and the meme essentially is no broadband or lack of broadband are poor grades. And then the, the fix to the meme is bring broadband to people and the school system will improve. And we, we sort of thought there was something to this story, but it probably was more complicated than this, right? And so we looked, said, okay, let's look into, into the homework gap. And, um, and so this is an example, but I think the, the lessons, there's two lessons. One is that broadband uh, matters, uh, but it matters in the following sense, probably more than the other. And that is, if you don't have it, you're disadvantaged. If you have it, you're not necessarily advantaged, right? I mean, there's other conditions in play. Broadband interacts with other conditions. And I think we already have heard sort of some of those, those hints this morning that it's necessary to think about the broader ecosystem in which broadband is embedded. So without going into lots of details, right? It's, it's difficult to get schools who are already stressed for time to collaborate in a research project that requires teachers to spend half an hour up or up to an hour of time in the classroom. Uh, and, uh, and so, but because of merit, sort of our good connections to schools and the importance of the topic, we were able to, to find uh, three uh, intermediate school districts. Uh, there were actually more who were interested in participating, but we just didn't have the, the resources to, to scale it. And, uh, and we developed a, uh, a multi-pronged approach. Uh, one was uh, a survey that we distributed in class that would help us understand how students use broadband, what kind of technology they have available, what they do with it. Uh, but that only gave us the sort of the input side, the use of broadband. We also needed outcome measures such as grades, uh, test scores and so forth. And, uh, and that uh, took us all the way into these privacy issues that Joe mentioned. So we had to come up with a very elaborate system of protections uh, that made it very complicated, it involved the schools as our data trustees. The schools were the only ones who knew the identity behind uh, those survey IDs, the, the anonymous numbers that we had available. Uh, in the end, we had uh, more than 3000 uh, observations at the level of individual students from 173 classrooms. Uh, 21 schools in 15 districts. Uh, one of them is the Eastern Upper Peninsula, the, the one on top, the, the very large geographically one. Then the little one, Miss um, um, Cola Osceola in, 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 in sort of the western part of Michigan, and then St. Clair in the, in, the, in, the, in the eastern part. And so we, we combined the behaviors that what students did with broadband, their experiences, with data on GPA, uh, SAT scores, and so forth. And, and that's a unique data set that I don't think nobody else in, in, in the country has. So thanks to all the participants, actually. What, some of the things that we saw were kind of re repeating what we already had known at this point, right? Uh, rural connectivity is worse than urban connectivity. That's not really big news. Uh, what was actually interesting is that 47% of rural students did not have fast broadband access. That was a very high number, higher than we anticipated. Those three school districts, I should say, uh, have both city and, urban and rural areas, but they were mostly rural. Uh, this is all compared to fast broadband. 30% of our students in cities and then 23% in, in um, suburban areas did not have fast broadband. Um, I should also say that, that there was a, we, we don't have an extra slide on this one, but there was a clear relationship between the quality of broadband access and homework completion, right? So 69% of the students without access said that they were frequently or often um, unable to complete homework. It was only 17% uh, of those who had fast broadband at homes. And so there's a clear relationship between those two. We also saw another thing that, that had not been discussed publicly, and that was that, that students with faster broadband access have higher digital skills. And digital skills are actually critical for all the other things that we talked about earlier today, right? I mean, being in business, being in, 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 in uh, ag tech, in uh, farming and so forth. But the links are more complicated than, than we had anticipated. And so to tease out what was in the data, we, we used multiple models. And I'm showing you two here. Uh, the one on the left hand side, right, uh, we kind of black boxed everything that, that goes in in the household, in the school and everything, right? We said, okay, let's just look at internet access on the one hand, 
different types of it and, and outcomes on the other hand. And then we have control variables. You know, we wanted to make sure we control for uh, uh, income uh, level, the education level of the parents, you know, uh, race and ethnicity, uh, uh, gender and so forth, uh, the grade level and other things that we thought were in play. So that we literally could tease out the net effect of how broadband links uh, to these outcomes. And then in the second approach, uh, which got very complicated very, very quickly, and I'm only going to show you uh, one, one, one selected piece of it, we unpacked the black box and said, now what, what's happened? what happens if we look into it, right? And, and the results were actually astonishing in a sense, right? Uh, they're consistent with each other, but if on, on the left-hand side, we get the sense that broadband really is directly related to grades and, and SAT scores and so forth, right? And that's, that's where the public policy debate was, uh, and is actually uh, in many ways. But if we unpack the black box, we see that the, the effect is only indirect. That there's no, this is, so, so, so just bringing broadband there, uh, unless you also align the other things of that learning ecosystem in the schools and in the household, just bringing broadband there only will have a very small effect. It's not, it's not negligible, but it's a very small positive effect only, right? And the full effect, uh, only only occurs if you if you look at those other factors and without going into details right and this is now in, in the first mode right this is black boxing everything that is done with broadband what we see is that that there's a clear link between uh, the, 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 sp the speed of access you see fast on the on the left hand side slow on, uh, in the second column no access in the third and then cell phone in, in the fourth column uh, and GPA now these are associations. Right. I mean, uh, it's hard in, in a panel uh, that, uh, that, that takes a snapshot really to, to make causal attributions. Here's so these associations that you see. Um, and um, th 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 there's two surprising things here, right? One is that cell phone access is, 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 is ranked so poorly. And this is, I have to explain what cell phone access here means. It means students use cell phones for homework uh, assignments, right? They don't, it's not that they use their cell phone as a hotspot at home with a tablet or a computer, but they, they use their cell phone. Right? And so what we think is going on here is, is the, this illusion that I am connected, but the affordances of the device are actually not good enough to really uh, do it well. And, uh, and you know, there's other things, uh, data caps, uh, for example, uh, fickle connectivity right at home and things like this. And this is a consistent pattern. Yeah, yes. Uh, Well, we did. We did. Uh, we, we used we used uh, a regression model to tease out those things, right? Uh, but but since, because all the data is from one one time uh, point, right? We can't really establish causation. We, we would have to have like points across different time periods. We are actually working on on follow ups. This is all at the end of the slides. There's several publications where this is all available. And I'd be happy to share this uh, individually with you. So, so you can read all the details in, in, in the published versions of, of, of two reports and then uh, uh, two papers. Um, so a clear link to, to grade point average. Um, and the difference is actually half a, half a grade point. So this is, not, this is not trivial, right? I mean, this is, this is actually the difference between uh, getting a scholarship to go to post-secondary education or not getting a scholarship. Um, and, uh, and, and many, many other disadvantages. Uh, these students also ranked lower on standardized test scores. What we don't see is clearly in this in this analysis, because the 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 link to test scores in SAT and PSAT is actually through digital skills, and dig, digital skills was another this was another surprising finding that we had. It's not again not on this slide, but in our, our more detailed reports, those, those are actually honed by just using technology, and interestingly. It's not just the instrumental use of digital technology to, to solve homework problems, for example, but the playful use of broadband, the, the chatting with my friends from school uh, on social media or, or via, via video chat and trying to solve a homework assignment. It's those sort of what, what seem to be collateral uses uh, that really sort of improve digital skills and those digital, higher digital skills then because students can multitask, they can, uh, can solve problems under time pressure. Then, then uh, relates to, to better test scores, uh, interestingly. Even, even just uh, playing video games, 
some people may not want to hear this, but even just playing video games, unless it's excessive, actually has a positive contribution to digital skills because it just it just trains sort of some of the the, the functions that we need to to use digital technology. Right. <laughs> so um, there's other things, and here's another another one that I want to share with you. This is sort of the plan to go to post secondary education. And again, you see the same pattern. The the labels are missing, but it's the same fast broadband. Is the 65 percent uh, slow slow uh, internet, uh, and then uh, no and cell phone. And and so what you see here is, is you know looks like a bar chart, but it's really a life story. Think about this, right? Most most um, life opportunities are tied to, to your longer-term educational planning, right? I mean, the human capital that you want to acquire. We do know that, that college education is important uh, or that the interest in, 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 in uh, STEM-oriented careers, right? We see a similar pattern in, with the interest of STEM uh, for, for STEM careers. I mean, students who have lower broadband or no broadband or only cell phone access are less interested in those types of careers. And so that translates into uh, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands of dollars of, of, of life income and, and opportunities for the communities at large. Now, if we look at the unpack the black box, and I'll just say a couple of words to this, what we see here is that those seeming direct effects, those associations, right, they are more complicated. They're still, they're still the same pattern uh, between uh, fast, slow, and cell phone access and no access. Uh, but the effects are essentially indirect. They're mediated through other variables such as homework completion, school interest, or school disinterest. Uh, and I, I, I'd be happy to, if there's, there's questions that go into this, but what we see here is that there is a whole ecosystem of, of interrelations, right? Uh, we looked at media use, we looked at uh, other factors such as our school uh, uh, activities um, and, and so forth. And the pattern is always the same, right? We, we see that that the quality of broadband matters, uh, that, that there is uh, disadvantages if you have slow connectivity or no connectivity or reliant only on a cell phone without using a hotspot. And, um, and we, 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 we see that those effects are statistically significant. So maybe in the interest of time, I can skip this. So, so what's, the, what's the conclusion right, from, 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 from um, this very sort of high level overview, and I'm, I'm actually drawing conclusions from Joe's presentation too. One is having sort of clear, accurate data on, on, the, on connectivity, the type of connectivity, the quality of connectivity is, is critically important to make good planning decisions, right? And, and so having, like we had in earlier statistical data, such nationwide averages probably is not good enough because every location is different, right? I mean, the fact that 20% that of Americans have X doesn't tell you that what happens locally uh, in your in your in your community. So having that granularity is important, and I think uh, we're moving in in that direction. Um, maybe slower than we wanted, but we're moving there. Secondly, the quality of broadband uh, connections and devices matters clearly, and but more in the sense that not having the right connectivity or not having the right device is a disadvantage. Right? Uh, ha having broadband connectivity and the right device only gives you a boost. If you also have a learning environment at home that sort of is conducive to supporting your digital learning. So we, we need to think about probably as maybe as school planners, how we can help parents to, to, to navigate, right? So a parent telling the, the, the young uh, person you cannot play video games or you cannot chat with your friends online is actually doing that, that uh, child a disservice to a certain degree. Um, and uh, um, uh, and and only <laughs> yeah, that's right. And only 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 you know this this that negative effect only kicks in if it's extremely uh, excessive, right? Finally, it's important that we that we think about the broader ecosystem. Right? As 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 money is available, there is a, a danger that we slip into this attitude: build it and they will come. And that alone will probably not really take advantage of the great opportunities that that uh, digital connectivity. Uh, provides in education and in business and in other areas. Thank you. Oh, oh um, yeah. Did we look at, uh, at at gender and race? And so, we, in in our, in our sort of framework, we use those as control variables. But we see we see uh, clear patterns that you keep in mind. This is rural Michigan, so so 
so race uh, in, in rural Michigan has a very unique sort of uh, picture, right? I mean, because it's 82% uh, white population. And then uh, there's, a, there's a relatively large Native American population, but a very, very small uh, black population, for example, right? And, and, but we do see patterns across those two. And then we looked at a uh, gender and income, yeah. And I, I, I'd be, um, what are, are you going to share the slides with everybody after the, because uh, at the end there is the, the, the resources to the publications, but I'd be happy to, to send you the links. Yeah, so this is something that we, we, we could not actually uh, identify. And, and it, was, it had to do with the, the way that the survey was being structured because we had to rely on, on responses from the students. Right? And so we, we, we had a, a method where we kind of um, triangulated their responses. So, so they, they essentially reported their experience using broadband. And, and they would give us their sort of uh, user experience as, as having fast broadband or slow. It turns out they were highly accurate because we did a, a speed test that they did at home uh, based on the MLab platform, right? Uh, it, and, uh, and, um, and we kind of uh, correlated the two and their answers literally is, was like a straight line. They were, they were very honest in that regard, right? And, and very much line. But eight to 11 creators, uh, we, we didn't we didn't believe that they would know that whether the problem was available or not right? and we could have probably been mapped um this but that would have required the schools to help us because we did we don't know actually where those in, those individuals live only the schools do okay, this is a good example of uh, attention to detail to get better data quality data too so i think there's some good really good lessons to learn thanks both of you uh so next up is john green uh here's his opening slide uh, so there's the guy that actually does the does the work. So I'm kind of anxious to hear some stories there. I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I look around the audience and I think I've been in this business longer than most of you have been alive, probably over half of you. So uh, I, I've seen a lot of changes in my career. I spent probably close to half of it working, as we affectionately call it, working for the dark side, AT&T as, as it were. <laughs> But uh, the last half of my career, I've had the privilege of working in rural America and working for small communications providers like New Lisbon, uh, both in Nebraska, Kansas, and uh, here in Indiana. So I kind of feel like I'm stepping in a little bit into both worlds. I know what it's like to be in an urban area and work for a big corporation. I also know what it's like to live in a rural area and work for a uh, rural broadband provider. So that kind of gives me a little bit of a unique perspective. I'm glad I'm not the one in charge trying to bring the slideshow up. But, uh, you know, listening to, to some of the conversation earlier, uh, the 477 data is such a joke. And the sad thing about it is it's a joke because everybody follows the rules. It's, it's, not, it's not like people are trying purposefully to put bad data in the 477 database. It's that the rules we have to follow result in bad data. So those of you that are not familiar with the, with the 477 database, that is the basic database that all grant and loan programs in the U.S. are currently using for getting broadband. And the biggest fallacy of the 477 is you could have a census block that's as small as a city block or as big as several square miles. And if only one person in that area has broadband service, it's considered entirely served, which is a joke. We all know that. But unfortunately, that's what we have to live with. So, okay, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my company and what we do. I'm not the enemy. I am a broadband provider. I do run a broadband company, but unlike I think some of the larger brethren, I live and eat and work and play in the same area in the same community with my, with my uh, customers. So when I go to the grocery store and I'm wearing my logo shirt that says NLBC on it, people walk up and go, Oh, are you with new Lisbon? Yes. Well, I either want to A, brag on your company, or B, tell you I've got a problem with it, and I don't know which it's going to be. So I have to be prepared for that, and all of my employees are the same way. We go to church with those people. We, we see them in the grocery stores. We run into them constantly. And I'm, I'm happy to say that by, by far, 
it's more praise. Either, either they are praising the service or they're saying, oh, I wish I had your service because my mother, brother, cousin, whoever has it and they love it and I can't get it. Can you get it to my area? And most of the time it's like, no, I'm sorry, we don't serve that area or I can't afford to serve that area. So it's a, it's a, tough, a tough situation sometimes, but it's one that I enjoy because there's nothing makes me happier than, than getting people connectivity and, and, and having them, you know, give us feedback that, by the way, we're tickled to death. So we are the parent company, New Lisbon Holdings, of three different broadband providers. Here in Indiana, New Lisbon Telephone Company is the incumbent. We were founded in 1901. And the reason the company was founded was because at that time, we couldn't get telephone service in the southeastern part of Henry County. AT&T was the big incumbent. They didn't want to build out into the county, so the farmers got together, strung up some lines, put together a switchboard, built their own network. Everything has evolved from that. So 120 years later, this is where we're at. New Lisbon Broadband is our competitive company. So those are areas outside of where we are considered the incumbent. So we serve parts of Henry County that, that we don't serve as an incumbent, as well as Wayne County and uh, Randolph County, and then small parts of Delaware and, and uh, Fayette and even, even in the areas of, uh, of Union County. So there's a little difference there. As the incumbent, we do receive funding from the federal and state government for providing broadband and telecommunications service. Yeah, I won't tell you it's a lot of money because it's not. Um, they talked, I think the lady with uh, Sacred Winds talked earlier about how much of, of their money came from federal sources and state sources. I can tell you less than 25% of our total funding comes from that different demographic. And our CLEC, our competitive area, zero. We get no support from any state or federal agencies in our CLEC unless we specifically go after a grant. And we have gotten one small grant from the federal government four years ago to build out an area that had exactly 23 customers in it, fiber to the home. And we got two other grants through the state's next level program to build out fiber to the home, I think is somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 customers total. But other than that, every other, every other bit of fiber or fixed wireless that we build, we, we build it on our own nickel and hope that we're going to get enough rate of return, enough customer take rate to be able to pay for it over 10, 15, 20 years. And then the third company is uh, Pennsylvania Telephone Company. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But in uh, Indiana, we've got approximately 3,400 customers. Of that, we do uh, video, voice, and telecommunications, and we do both fixed wireless and fiber to the home. So we do have a fixed wireless uh, play as well as a fiber to the home play. So there's a map that shows uh, the area that we serve. The green outlines are the county outlines. We, we serve all of uh, Randolph County pretty much with wireless. Now, I, when I say all of that, no, there's, it's wireless there are areas we can't serve because if, if you understand how fixed wireless works because of the spectrum we have allocated, it's purely a line of sight play, whether it's CBRS, five gigahertz, 2.4, whatever, it's still predominantly a line of sight play. So if a house has a shelter belt, trees all the way around it, they can't see the tower, they can't get the service. So we can't say that we serve 100% of the county, but we've got well over 1,000 customers in Randolph County scattered all over the county. Wayne County is very similar. Wayne County, if you're familiar with it, is far more hilly than Randolph County. Randolph is like it is here. It's flat. But you get down into Wayne County, you start having problems not only with trees, but also with hills. I won't call them mountains. They're just small hills. And then Henry County, uh, the southeastern part of Henry County outside of Newcastle is where our ILEC is located. You'll notice the blue and the yellow, that is fiber. So if, you'll, if you look at that little green box inside of the big green box, that is our ILEC, our, our, our uh, regulated territory. It's 100% fiber to the home. 
So everybody in our regulated area can get fiber to the home up to gigabit speed if they should so, so choose to. We finished that this year. Uh, we haven't got everybody cut over. We're, we're still got a lot of people that say, ah, you know, I, I'm okay with the copper. Put me at the end of the list or I can't be off work. You know, can you, can you schedule it sometime in the next couple of months? But by the end of the year, we, we've got less than 50 people left to cut over. We'll have all of that done. So we're pretty proud of that. We're, you know, a lot of companies are working, striving toward that goal to be 100% fiber to the home. And we can say in our regulated area that we have done that. And by the way, one of the things that we have recently done is, is we have eliminated some of our tiers. When we started out, we were at 25 meg as our base. We've now bumped everybody to 50 meg. So we only offer 50, 100, and then gigabit. And our gigabit's $99 a month. Is that cheap? No. Is it comparatively cheap? I think probably yes. But 50 by 50 is still a pretty good deal at $65 a month. So we feel like, you know, competitively speaking, I think we've got a pretty good deal. There are no data caps. It's unlimited. The latency is sub 10, 15 milliseconds. The jitter is almost non-existent. So it is a rock solid product. So the other company I'm going to talk about briefly is going to be Pennsylvania Telephone Company, founded in 1909, and it is a regulated company in central Pennsylvania. Uh, I won't try to explain where it is other than if you know anything about Pennsylvania, Williamsport is the home of the Little League World Series, and we are over the mountain from Williamsport, about 15 minutes away. But it's a valley surrounded by mountains. It has no large communities of size. When I say of size, maybe 50 people in a community. There's no schools in that area. There are only a half a dozen businesses. It's all agriculture. And now we're starting to see people move into the area because it's beautiful. You can get a house on the side of the mountain that overlooks the valley. And people think, oh, this is a great place to retire. Great hunting, great fishing, a lot of, a lot of outdoor activities. Uh, PTC is a little different because they are not 100% fiber to the home. We purchased the company last year. They serve about 900 customers, and we saw a real opportunity to advance that area with a fiber build out. But again, it's, it's not a very big area, 57 square miles, predominantly agriculture, and no large communities. And there's a map. If you were to go up to the upper right-hand corner of the Northeast, just across the Susquehanna River, sets Williamsport. So it's about two hours out of Philadelphia, probably three hours out of uh, Pittsburgh. So pretty much in the North Central part of the state. The yellow line is the outline of the, uh, what we call the regulated territory. We don't serve anything outside of that area. We're surrounded Verizon to the North, Frontier and Windstream to the South. The purple and red lines are the backbone fiber networks that they did build, but everything else is copper. So 25 meg is the fastest internet speed that they can provide service to. And that is if you're not too terribly far from the equipment. There are some areas that can't even get 10 meg. So that's why we're doing a fiber to the home build out. That was one of the things that, that I intended once we purchased the company is to bring them up to the same level that we've done at New Lisbon. And we think within five years, we'll be 100% fiber to the home there. So some of the things that we have seen in the way of obstacles to deploying good broadband, and I'll say affordable broadband because that was also mentioned earlier. Can you afford broadband? And I'm on a sidebar for just a minute. It's tough to get people to admit that they don't make enough money to afford broadband. Case in point, the federal government has their EBPP or their, their broadband program that they just came out with. And it was basically, if you meet this criteria, then you can get $50 a month, I believe it is, off, knocked off your broadband bill or practically free broadband in some cases. And out of the over 4,000 customers that we provide service to, we have had absolutely zero inquiries. Nobody. 
had a call with one of the associations last week and they were talking about how many people have you had interested in this program? Very few. Most companies were just like ours. There's a pride factor in rural America. And we've got to figure out a way to make it easier for these people to get subsidies, however you want to put it, so that broadband is affordable, so they're willing to do it. The other side of that coin, and I don't, I don't know, none of you are broadband providers, so you have no idea the amount of red tape and paperwork with this federal program is absolutely overwhelming. If, if we had hundreds and hundreds of people that were interested, I'd probably have to hire at least one person just to handle the paperwork. It is that bad. It is a full-time job. And that's the other side of the coin to making these, these programs work. They look good on paper. When Congress passes the bill, it sounds great. We're going to give people $50 a month for their broadband. And then they hand it to a federal agency and say, go out and administer this program. Okay, here's a 75-page list of rules and, and, and different things that you have to do and meet before you're going to be able to. We've got some companies that have yet to be able to go through the sign-up process because they can't figure out how to do it. So it shouldn't be that difficult. So I get off my soapbox and go back to my slide presentation. Number one on the list, there's too many competing and conflicting state and federal programs, and there's not enough coordination between the two. And I'm going to pick on Indiana, which, by the way, I am a big fan of the Next Level Funding Program in, in uh, Indiana, the Next Level Connections Program. Here's the reason why. A, it's not a total giveaway. It's a grant program. You have to put money into it. I think the base on the first two rounds is 25%. Now it's 35%. You got skin in the game which means I can't just come in and promise things and not put any money into it. I have to put at least 35% of the money into that program before I get any kind of a match. So $40,000 a mile, you can see real quick that the construction costs can be exorbitant. And to tell me that you're going to spread my money over 10 years doesn't really help me with that initial cost. So somehow we've got to figure out a better way to do that. With the state of Indiana, it's immediate. With that program, you turn in receipts, you get reimbursed. You turn in receipts, you get reimbursed. When you run out of your money, the rest of it's on you. But it's a two-year program. You have to have that turned up and functioning and people working on it in two years. With the federal programs, it's more like, I think it's a certain percentage, but it basically goes out to five years. And there's no coordination between the two. So you've got overlap. You may have one or two federal agencies that are offering funding in the same areas that you've already seen funding, you know, from a state program and vice versa. Number two on the list, poor data on existing services. I think we probably beat that one to death. The 477 is a problem. We need some mapping and we need it quick because we're giving away hundreds of billions of dollars based on bad data. It would be nice if we could say, whoa, let's not give that money away until we got good data, but the governmental agencies haven't decided to do that. Supply chain and labor issues is something that a lot of people don't realize just how bad it is. I can't get electronics equipment because all of the chips are being sent to the automotive industry. Broadband companies can't get any type of electronic equipment now because all the intel and the different chips are going to Ford Motor Company and General Motors to make cars and trucks. But yet broadband's more important. How does that work? So that's an interesting issue. Won't get into any more detail on that. Labor is a problem. How many of you are going to go into the broadband business when you graduate? And if you do, are you going to want to live out in rural America? Because I can tell you, we're not at the same pay scale that they are in Indianapolis or Chicago or New York, but at the same time, cost of living is a lot lower. But I have a hard time finding people that are willing to go to work and live in a, in a rural area, and that's across the country. 
And if we do find people that are willing to do it, we have to train them from the ground up because there's not, they're not learning these skills in colleges and universities and, and, uh, and uh, uh, two-year tech schools anymore. Technology claims versus actual capabilities and coverages. We can talk about that from now until the cows come home. At the end of the day, it has to be, can I cover 100% of that area? The discussion earlier about the wireless coverage and why we can't do that in E-rate, I'll give you a real good reason why, because you can't cover 100% of the people in that area with wireless, not given today's technology. So if you're a school, how do you say you can get it, but you can't and call that equitable? That's a real problem. And it's not a matter of saying that, that wireless is better than fiber or fiber is better than wireless. It's a matter of saying, what am I wanting to do? Am I wanting to get a cheap service, cheap, inexpensive service that can cover a lot of people quickly? Or do I want to build something that's going to be scalable for the next 10, 20, 30 years that's going to cost more, but every time you go in front of a house, they're covered. So that's a big discussion. I don't know what the answer is. I think it's got to be a, a combination of all the above. Penalties for non-performers. I'll just touch on this briefly. There's two very large tier one telecommunications companies that have gotten billions of dollars of support. They have not met their, their uh, milestones and yet they get a light slap on the wrist and get told, go out and do it. So if we don't start penalizing companies that take federal and state money for not doing their job, then the woe will be on us. I think that's a problem that needs to be resolved. And then the last one is the baseline, 25-3. How many people in the room think 25-3 is adequate broadband? Nobody. The average internet speed in the United States today is about 43 meg down, average. So why would we be building a network to 25-3 when we're already above that on average? You know, it probably should be set at least at 100 meg, possibly higher. We're setting at 25-3 because we're thinking, well, at least if we set it by 25-3, everybody can get it, and then maybe we can scale it up later on. The problem is with the technology that we use, if you build a network to do 25-3, and only 25-3, in five years, you're going to be right back spending money again, building the network over again. So that's why I am a big proponent of fiber. Yeah, I can sell you 25-3, but you can get gigabit or 10 gigabit or 100 gigabit without having to do a forklift, you know, turnover or replacement of that entire network. I think that that's the end. I hope I got through it quick enough. Good. Appreciate so it. Uh, one thing that John mentioned that I think links to the previous presentation is this notion of the pride factor. Layer in pride factor with the influence on education, and you have quite a situation to address. My name is Christy Goodson. I'm the senior dark fiber specialist for TVA, which is Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, if you guys are not familiar with TVA, I've got a little slide that kind of shows our synopsis. Uh, we are a federal government corporation. We were established in 1933. Uh, we have a seven state territory, largely the state of Tennessee, and a little bit uh, of each of the surrounding states, uh, a, a decent chunk of Mississippi. We were established during the New Deal, and our main focus at the time was uh, flood control, which quickly expanded into the uh, electric sector. Um, in that time, only large cities had electricity. Um, none of the rural areas had electricity. And we quickly also added um, economic development to that. So we kind of live by what we call the three E's, um, energy, the environment, and economic development. Uh, we are a primarily generation and transmission. That's our main line of business. We generate power and transmit it uh, over our infrastructure to 153 local power companies. Uh, what you guys would know is in the distributor uh, space, 
our guys like to be called local power companies though, because uh, just like a lot of you guys are, um, John was saying earlier, he goes to church and, and shops in the grocery store with his customers. And that's the way our, our local power companies view their relationship as well. Our footprint covers 80,000 square miles and we have about 10 million people that we serve. We focus very much on how we serve the people of the Valley that is incredibly important to us is that, that we serve them and we are here to better um, the Valley. We do a lot of uh, bringing in of industry, uh, a lot of job recruitment, a lot of resource development, uh, reservoirs, parks and, and everything. And while we very definitely are not a broadband provider, um, that's, that's not under our purview, uh, we consider ourselves broadband supporters um, and advocates. Uh, we know that it's it's the next thing that's going to bring, you know, jobs, keep people near those farms. Uh, Tennessee does an incredible amount of farming. Uh, so we know that a lot of the things you guys are concerned about, we're also concerned about it, even though we are not in the business ourselves. Uh, we have a lot of our power companies that now look into the into broadband. Uh, they have chosen to do that because it was unserved. And just so you know a little bit about my, my background, before I came to TVA, um, I didn't work for the dark side, but I worked for the dark side's first cousin. Uh, I worked for another, uh, for a commercial carrier uh, for almost 20 years before coming to TVA five years ago. And my specialty there was building um, mainly long haul, some middle mile networks. Uh, worked a lot in uh, co-location, interconnection, essentially making uh, lines what you call facilities based. Uh, worked a lot in that and it's been about five months kind of on what you call the local service side and in building those and quickly moved into, uh, I found a true love for building fiber networks and connecting the dots and finding ways to create unique routes for areas that didn't have service or unique routes to get between two points so that you could make that new route more economically feasible. So that's kind of where my specialty came in. And, and so about five years ago, I had the chance to come and, and bring those skills to TVA and kind of marry my love of network and data communications and fiber and all of that, along with my love of serving, you know, my community. And so that's how I fit in at TVA. Since the late 80s, TVA has had a history of we do um, dark fiber leasing in certain instances, uh, only with surplus fiber. We never actually build any fiber that we ourselves don't use. But if there's a way um, to have surplus and allow someone to use it, we have done some contractual contractual arrangements to allow that in the past, primarily with our local power companies to help their distribution system. But we have found other things that it's applicable to. So one of the things that I work on here at TVA a lot is kind of how do we support our local power companies as they deploy broadband? Um, a lot of them are very new in the business. Uh, they may not necessarily have the, the knowledge behind that, but they want to get into the business because they know that in a lot of areas there, nobody's going to bring broadband to them um, unless they find a way to make it happen themselves in their community. So this uh, right here, uh, referencing the 477 data that we all know is so flawed, um, but this is currently what we feel is a decently accurate representation of the unserved and underserved areas um, using the 253 standard, which we all know is, is far below what it should be. This is essentially what we know exists in TBA, and this concerns us uh, because we know that these areas that are in orange here, those are less densely populated. And if the big carriers haven't served them by today, they're not going to serve them. Um, you know, unless there's a whole lot of federal money that's dumped, and then again, will it be spent appropriately? 
So one of the things we are looking into is how can we kind of convene the players who could help fill in these gaps? Um, how could we turn these orange sections off, essentially, is what we would like to see. So in some of these areas, we know that even the, one, the areas that are not orange, we know that while they do have the ability to get 25, 30 above internet speeds, those areas, those people may not can afford it. Um, they may not have the devices. Uh, if they do have the devices, can they actually use those devices? And we know that most people understand that you use a device that they're most familiar with, which happens to be your phone. They're most familiar with their smartphone. Well, smartphone doesn't necessarily translate into workforce efficiency. Um, just because you can use the, the app on your phone for something doesn't mean that you can go in and understand how to correctly process an inventory report on a company's proprietary software. So that's another thing we're looking at is how could we convene the players to look at how do we enhance the workforce because that falls to our economic development. Um, we do know that a lot of the areas that are out there today, um, they in these orange areas, they are currently in the RDOF pipeline to be served. More than 20 of our local power companies stepped up to the plate and got over $200 million of RDOF funding. Um, they're currently in the process of, you know, going through that, to, you know, going through that process to get that funding and start deploying those. However, we know it's not gonna be enough. $200 million is not going to solve all of this orange. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that we're focusing on right now is, how can we educate? How can we convene the right people? And how can we have those discussions um, to make those changes? Because even some of these areas that are not orange today that have what they need, we know that yes, they've got it, but they don't, there's the people there, they can't afford it, they can't use it. So we're very concerned about that. Um, the state of Tennessee has a very large grant program. We are plugged in with them. And they, uh, the state actually allocated $100 million over this next uh, fiscal year to go towards broadband deployment um, with their grant program. Um, if you guys have not uh, talked with the state of Tennessee, if you or you know, your state are considering grant programs, I would highly recommend uh, Crystal Ivy and her team um, to help to talk to you guys about that because they are very, very uh, well-versed in, in how to handle this. Um, so the, the biggest thing we're seeing TVA is kind of, I guess you could say, we're sort of like this little microcosm of the US. Uh, we have flatlands, we have farmlands, we have mountains, we have rivers, we have everything. So it, from my years in, in building broadband, uh, when, when I was at the carrier, pretty much everything I encountered when I was building networks, I see in just the TBA territory and, and what our LPCs are going through. So it's really important to us to try to you know, play off that. And we know that because of this, not every area can use the same solution. Um, that's why we're very much a proponent of what works with that particular area, but that's not gonna work for, you know, four counties over, three counties over. What's good in Northeast Tennessee is not going to be good for, um, you know, Southern Mississippi. So we have a lot of that uh, that we're seeing. Um, a lot of our LPCs, uh, some of them were in the business more than 15 years ago, and, and they're considered kind of pioneers um, in that industry. We have one town that they have less than 30,000 people in this town. And for over 10 years, you've been able to get a gig of internet to your house. 
um, in this little town that's less than 30,000, but it's because their board stepped up, saw a need and fulfilled it. Uh, we see that happening all over now, as I'm sure you guys are as well, because if, if the big companies could have brought the solution to rural America, they would have done it by now. Um, and the, the one thing that I think is going to be, to me, it's going to be kind of the tipping point for making broadband accessible and affordable to all, especially in the rural space, is, um, let me advance my slide. Um, this is a graph that, I did not create this graph. Um, I just found it randomly as an image on the internet and then added some notes to it. Um, the space that I used to work in at the carrier was primarily long haul networks and in metro and in regional networks with some metro. Um, everybody tends to think, oh, okay, if we solve all of the, the access networks along the bottom, if we get it to the homes, if we get it to the businesses, that's going to solve everything. Um, my concern is that the only way to truly solve that issue and make it affordable is when you have broad-based deployment of effective and affordable and economically functioning um, regional, what you would call the middle mile networks. Um, that's the biggest expense um, that I see a lot of companies are undertaking because you can get the capital plant deployed out there and yes, you have the maintenance. But the issue that happens if you do not have good, strong, uh, robust middle mile networks especially middle mile networks that are decently expensive to get to the internet on ramps. Essentially you've had, you have five people taking dips into everybody's bottom line um, because it's gotta be handed off to hand it off to hand it off. Um, and everybody wants cut because they had to, they have to make their money back on their networks. But I think if we can see a push and I'm very encouraged in that some of the, the funding bills that are being shown are gonna be applicable to the building of middle mile networks. And I think that's what's gonna make the internet to rural areas actually affordable for both the consumers and those who, who create and build the, metro, the middle mile networks and the, the fiber to the home networks. Because right now, if you were in a small town you are paying on, a, on an average five to eight times more per meg than someone in a tier one or tier two city. Um, and that means that you have to think more about by OPEX return rather than your CAPEX return. And that's one of the things that I think is we, if we go forward this is kind of gonna, th these I think are the critical pieces that people forget. Um, while fiber to the home is important, um, a lot of people I think get so focused on building the, what I call, they, they build these great roads, but they end up being roads to nowhere because there's no middle mile to push them back to. Um, at least that's affordable and that, that pushes a lot of people out. So um, I'm excited to see kind of the what's coming down as far as the new infrastructure builds. And I really think that's gonna be key um, to, the, to changing the rural broadband landscape. I do like, it was back just one slide or two, you're pointing out to this notion of not only can you get it, or could you have it, but can you afford it? Do you have the advice uh, devices? And do you have the knowledge? And that also relates to the earlier presentation about educational resources yeah, uh, it's not just have it, but be yeah. able to use it. I mean, because some of the some of the best broadband um, networks in America are right in your inner cities, and those people can't afford them. Yeah. Um, they might have four providers, but they they can't afford them. There's there's a great article that came out a couple of months ago um, in the Washington Post, and they actually used a a, a, a psychologist in East Knoxville and she said that at the onset of the pandemic those that she counseled who were low income she had to start timing her sessions with them because everything had to go virtual she had to actually start timing her sessions with them to be around when their data plan 
on their phone reloaded because that's the only way she could see them virtually because once their, their data plan, they reached their limit on bandwidth, they couldn't have to do that. So they were, they were having to take that into account that mm -hmm. yeah, their lifeline, phone, their lifeline phone gave them some, but not enough for what the rest of us could have every day. Yeah. That reminds me of the early days of our bag phone and how many minutes you got in a month and uh, how that's constraining, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and our last speaker, first of all, I wanna thank Alex for, to, for Telrad sponsoring uh, this event that we're doing. Uh, and then you have some comments as well, Alex uh, Freilichman. Thank you. My name is Alex Freilichman. I'm uh, VP of sales at uh, Telerad Networks. A little bit, of, a little bit about me. Um, I've been, like John said, living, breathing, drinking, smelling, sleeping wireless technology for almost 20 years. Uh, my personal motto is making world faster. I literally wake up and go to bed every day, travel, I don't know how many millions of miles, you know, internationally and domestically, to make sure that we introduce technology to, uh, to people uh, that can effectively and efficiently deliver data from point A to point B. In our rapidly changing world, Full-time high-speed internet connectivity is essential to our daily lives. We at Telrad provide state-of-the-art fixed wireless access technology. Our purpose-built LTE system offers robust and secure connectivity in the most challenging terrains, satisfying current and future bandwidth needs. Telrad TD LTE solution covers all major global frequency bands in 2, 3 GHz, and unlicensed 5 GHz, and we are fully CBRS compliant for our United States customers. Telrad's cost-optimized configurations with flexible coverage and capacity options offers operators to maintain a more efficient, cost-effective network that delivers an optimal user experience. Telrad's LTE in a Box offers an end-to-end -end network solution fit for small and large operators alike, designed to simplify network operations and increase service quality. Telrad's single vendor approach offers network operators peace of mind by taking ownership of the LTE ecosystem end-to-end while maximizing network operators' value, quality of service, and total cost of ownership. Get more from wireless with Telrad. Contact us today, sales at telrad.com. 1-844-4-TELRAD. Uh, we are about 70 year old company. Uh, we were established in 1952, pretty much the very first technology firm in the state of Israel since its inception, 1951. Um, so uh, until today, we probably have about close to 4 million, maybe an excess of 4 million end user devices shipped, subscriber units. So um, yeah, hundreds of LTE networks. So when we talk about broadband connectivity for rural agriculture, low density, high density applications, mobility, we know a couple things about it. We also know a few things about connectivity in, for near and non-line of sight, which is very challenging. We understand the fre frequencies, the physics, what happens with you know, the Fresnel zone, the propagation, what happens with RF when it travels. We also understand the latency. So, so um, you know, we've been around a little bit and we try to steer people and provide, educate them because I'm a strong believer in education to make sure that People that make that decision understand what they, you know, what the consequence of that. So, um, just a quick example uh, of how our technology served our customers in past year during the COVID. So, when the COVID hit, so we obviously have a good idea what is the, exactly the average bandwidth utilization, regardless what. Like, remember that. You know, when we talk about bandwidth, some of the, mo some of the 
the reactors are have a political connotation, and then there is a reality, right? So nobody ever actually asked or looked, what is the actual bandwidth utilization per user on average? We can actually, we have the numbers, we understand because LTE network uses Evolve Packet Core, EPC. So all the data is aggregated at a certain you know, central location or more than one certain, uh, one than central location, but uh, more than one, but doesn't matter. We can, we have an efficient way to look at the data and say, okay, we have a network of 1000 users. How much bandwidth are they actually using at any given time during the peak hours, after hours, during the, you know, uh, in the downlink or uplink? So in this room, who can give me an answer? What do you guys think? What is the actual peak user data utilization on the network? 4.5 megabits per second. Hello, world. So when we talk about bandwidth and you, saw it, you say, okay, 25 megabit customers, what does it mean in terms of how many customers can you effectively serve, deliver broadband connectivity of 20 megahertz LTE carrier? We have these numbers too, right? So we are the guys that make the technology, that stand behind the technology. We actually understand what happens. And, and we do like to share this information because it's important for those networks. So to give you, to, to step back a little bit, COVID, as horrible as, 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 as stuff that it brought to the world and obviously the United States, what happened to our networks? Exactly the same equipment that was deployed. What, what happened on the networks when people went working remote, the drive for the bandwidth went up, the need for the bandwidth went up for obvious reasons, right? So suddenly your four and a half megabits per second becomes more. Okay, understand, understandable. What does it mean in terms of customer satisfaction? If everybody began using not four and a half, but let's say 10 or five or seven megabits per second. So suddenly a certain amount of bandwidth is not adequate enough to serve that amount of customers. So the technology that Telerad has and have was very simple software upgrade path to increase the capacity. So suddenly people could just go and double the capacity of their infrastructure with a simple software upgrade without climbing the tower. So suddenly 100 megabits per second, per second becomes 200. And it can happen in a matter of minutes. You don't have to buy any, I mean, you have, well, actually we provided complimentary keys for our customers just to go and do it for a limited time for initially it was 60 days. Then we gave another 60 days because that was the right thing to do. So, um, so this is the place and time for our technology, for us to be there, to educate and share some of the, exper some of the experiences and expertise that we have with the world and you know, what happens with wireless. Obviously fiber is a gold standard. Nobody's questioning it. And if you can't deliver fiber, <laughs> and if it costs you 7,000 a mile or 40,000, and in Kentucky and some Appalachian sites, I even heard, John, uh, I even, even heard $52,000 a mile. This is crazy dollars. It's just, but then you also have lead times. How long does it take to deploy the fiber? Schools start in a couple months. So what we're doing right now, we are involved in number of projects domestically in the United States, in multiple states from Virginia to Alabama to South uh, Carolina. I mean, pretty much <laughs> probably 30% of the states in the US. Uh, where school districts are deploying their own private LTE networks to deliver connectivity to their students within the campus and deliver connectivity off campus to their students. And the beauty part of private LTE network, like uh, one of the speakers mentioned earlier, is you own the infrastructure and you can do a lot of interesting things. You can create neutral host. You can share infrastructure with public safety. You can share infrastructure with 
obviously for educational purposes. Um, uh, you can share infrastructure, you can sell bandwidth um, uh, to, to, to residential, residential customers through public private partnerships. And it's all done through exactly the same infrastructure, through exactly the same uh, base stations that are already in the air. So, uh, and everybody is running in its own secured and efficient lane and everybody is happy. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's really about it. Not gonna bore you to death with the stuff. Uh, so my name is Alex Frelichman. And uh, if you have any questions about the LTE or broadband connectivity or technologies, uh, 4G, 5G and so on, I'll be more than happy to assist and answer. You're waiting to find out who the big three are. Is that it? Well, listen, without the competition, we wouldn't be in business, right? That's, that's what makes us wake up in the morning and say, okay, what can we do different? Uh, so the industry, just like any broadband industry, just like any other industry, go, will go through consolidation through a certain point and so on. The, 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 at the end of the day, RF is RF. And if LTE comes back and says, my spectral efficiency is five and a half bits per hertz, it's five and a half bits per hertz. Okay, six, or two feet, six point, six point three. But the point is that 20 megahertz, 10 megahertz carrier can do 50 megabits. That's it. Wireless is wireless, RF is RF. So, so what's important is really to, to, to step back and understand, okay, what else? do you have? What is the value proposition? Are you building a mobile style network or you're building a fixed wireless style network where difference is simple? Are you taking, is your objective for the network quality and consistency of the bandwidth or coverage? On the mobile network, what happens on the mobile network with these things? You move. So your expectation of bandwidth is what? None. <laughs> what happens on a fixed wireless network? How often do you move the house? <laughs> yeah, but base stations also move, so it's all right. <laughs> so, but uh, the, the, the point is that objectives are different. So suddenly when you're building the network, you, you, you start questioning, okay, are you going with and well, are you reusing same frequency across the board or you're building proper channelization? RF is RF. There is no magic there. If you hit the foliage along the way, what happens with RF? Well, the lower the frequency, the better the penetration, right? So, so you, your signal can travel further. But at six, uh, you, can, you can talk about those hundreds of megabits per second speeds or gigabit speeds. Yeah, but they're all at 60 gigahertz. It's useless in the rural markets. So, so you have to, I mean, it's, it's it, what, what happens with vendors is when you're being bombarded, you have to use it as an education, right? Uh, learn from them. What are they trying to sell you or offer you? What is the value proposition there? And, but at the end of the day, it's a technology that delivers data from point A to point B. The question is, is it the right technology for you? Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question and it has to do with CBRS and the Navy essentially controlling that or being primary user or whatever. I will say this before we get to Alex's response. The largest naval station is in Indiana. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, so I can talk about CBRS for days in and days out. And I will start. I'll, I will start, you know, with, uh, uh, with so so in past year during the past, so the concept of CBRS the shared spectrum is quite yeah you know, interesting right it's not this new I, unlicensed world we've all been sharing the spectrum the the idea with with CBRS is that you have some kind of a central entity an AI driven you know, called, you come in, you ask, I need a channel, here's the channel. Essentially, this is the situation. Now, 
the rules are if you are within the coastal markets of the uh, geographies of the US, depending on east, west, or south, uh, you, you may be located within so called dynamic protection areas, DPAs. So they'll go from anywhere from, let's say, 100 miles to about 300 miles in, in, inland, um, uh, approximately. I'm kind of rounding the numbers up. So if you are inland, you are not affected by DPAs. So at that point, you're only worried about two tiers, PALS, Priority Access License, and GAA. So DPA is no longer in, in the consideration. Guys that are in California, in Texas, I mean, Florida, it doesn't matter, New York, the West, the East Coast. Yes, they also have to be concerned about the DPA triggers. And that's where, again, Telerad, in past year, it was very educational when you get a phone call in the middle of the night, hey, my radios went down. And what customers know about us, the way the Telerad operates, I mean, we're, yeah, we're a decent sized company, but we're, what people know is, this is my mobile number. I am your feast and I'm your button pusher. If, if there is an issue, I need to know about it. Yes, we do have support, but yeah, I'm your guy. So, so getting a phone call in the middle of the night from, from a customer, the network is down, it's probably service, I mean, it's important, service effective. Because I often say, listen, just like John, he gets paid to serve the customers, not not to serve the customers. When customer doesn't care that there is a Navy ship somewhere 100 miles off the coast that triggered the radar and, and the channel got suspended. So this is where Telerad comes in and says, okay, we understand CBRS is awesome. It got awesome coexistence you know, ideas and, and people building the algorithms for a coexistence. But what if, and the what if part is the logic that Telerad implements with, this, with the CBRS system to say, okay, can we execute continuity of service? If things happen, is there a logic that drives all that? Just in fact, yesterday I did a webinar with Google. We did a webinar with Google uh, about specifically about CBRS. So, um, so there are there are certain things that are implemented in the system where where, where we drive certain logic and automation to to ensure that if one channel is not available, there is another channel. Can we minimize the downtime? Okay, you change the base station to a different channel. Great. What happens with subscriber units? <laughs> well, they have to follow. LTE is not exactly a, a very you know, organized system. So, so that's, but in general, I'm a true believer in CBRS. If this, that's the question. I'm a true believer in this system. And as a, as a company, we made an intentional investment to, to write a software that works well, that's gonna differentiate us from others. In fact, today I can say, I challenge others to compare against our CBRS. And, um, and the last piece is this whole domain proxy part is free to our customers. It's complimentary. We don't monetize of CBRS. Yes, we do sell hardware, we do sell services, we do sell licenses, but we do not monetize of CBRS. We feel it's 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 necessary for networks to run correctly for LTE networks, and that's what makes it different.